Well, welcome, Parsha for Eira. Yeah. We can get started right away. I did make you the co-host. Thank you. So you should be able so, to get started. Uh, first of all, uh, there was a question at the end of last week's class. Uh, somebody uh, said that they had a notation or something, an indication about a, a different Haftarah uh, for the Yemenites. Uh, and uh, I, I checked, uh, and I, I must say it has eluded me so far. Uh, I found a reference to an alternate Haftarah for Sephardim for last week, but have not been able to trace down one for uh, Yemenites. Uh, but it gives me an opportunity just to elaborate on something that I uh, referred to briefly in our very, very first meeting. Um, and that is, has to do with the history of the Haftarah. Um, those of you who were there may recall, uh, uh, those of you who weren't there can't recall, but you may know it anyway, that uh, the original practice uh, uh, probably um, uh, into at least the, the early, if not the high Middle Ages, uh, was that the, uh, the Torah was read publicly, not annually, as we do today, but triennially. That is to say, it took three years to complete the full cycle of a Torah reading. Um, it means, of course, that uh, Shabbat services were a lot briefer uh, than they'd become, unless, of course, maybe rabbis made up for it by speaking longer. Um, but uh, the one thing that it certainly did do uh, was that if every, uh, if every Shabbat's Torah reading is accompanied by a Haftarah, and it takes three years to read the Torah instead of one, it means that there are three times as many Haftarot. So it's not surprising to find that on any given parasha, there may very well be more than one tradition of what is its accompanying haftarah. Uh, the difference, of course, will be, um, there is actually a record of it. Um, I, 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 it's in a book that is in my office uh, that I haven't been to in six months. Uh, so I, I, couldn't really, I couldn't really produce it for you. Uh, but again, courtesy of the Cairo Geniza, we do know exactly what those extra haftarot were. So that if nowadays, let's say there are 50, roughly 50 Shabbatot in a year, uh, so it means that there were at one time 150 Haftarot. And if there were roughly three Haftarot for each week's Sidra, it means that there was a choice of three different things within each Sidra that could be chosen for a Haftara. So just give you an example. Uh, last week's Sidra, Shemot, if you recall, the Haftarah that we studied together, the Ashkenazi Haftarah, um, was a, a selection from the Navi that began with Habaim Yashresh Yaakov. And uh, I suggested that if the link was more of a literary or linguistic, linguistic one than a thematic one, uh, because the, the, uh, the book of Shemot begins with Ela Shemot Bnei Yisrael Habaim Mitzrayma Eit Yaakov. So you have the words Habaim and Yaakov in the same pasuk. Uh, I mentioned just a, a couple of minutes ago that there is a Sephardi alternative to last week's Haftarah. And the Sephardi alternative to last week's Haftarah is the first chapter in the book of Yirmiyahu. Now, the first, the first chapter of Yirmiyahu has nothing to do with the exodus from Egypt, nothing to do with the enslavement or oppressions of the Jews in Egypt before the exodus. What it does, have, however, is that it is the story of how Yirmiyahu was selected by God and was transformed from uh, an ordinary person into a Navi. So it could very well be that that was selected in order to parallel the fact that in last week's Sidra, we have the story of how Moshe was chosen by God and transformed from being an ordinary person, which he really wasn't even at that moment in his life. He was still a bit extraordinary, but transformed from an ordinary person into a Navi. So indeed, as I said, it's not surprising to find that there are alternatives. Okay, that said, we can now have a look at uh, this week's Haftarah. And this week's Haftarah 
is from the book of uh, the prophet Yechezkeel, uh, whom we have encountered uh, already on a previous occasion. Uh, you may recall most recently, only uh, three weeks ago, the Sidra Vayigash uh, featured a, uh, a selection from uh, the book of Yechezkeel, the one that spoke about how the prophet was instructed by God to take two wooden slates. On one, he was to write the word Yehuda, on the other, he was to write the word Yisrael, and then he was to combine them together. And that would be a symbol of the fact that when the Jews returned from uh, their captivity, from the exile, they would be reunited together under a united monarchy. Okay, so here we have a selection that begins uh, towards the end of chapter 28 in the book of Yechezkeel and continues through the uh, 29th uh, chapter. And it begins, as you see here, the first section of the Haftarah, uh, Sukim, that together uh, obviously are a follow-up to what preceded it. And they are words that the prophet uh, addresses to the Jewish people uh, of consolation, okay? Ko amar Hashem uh, Elohim, the kabbzi at Beit Yisrael min ha'amim, God says that when he will gather the house of Israel back, min ha'amim asher nafotsuvam, from the, uh, amongst the nations in whose midst they have been scattered, v'nikdashtivam le'enei ha'goyim, and God declares that he will be sanctified in them, in the full sight of these nations, the Yashavu alad matam, and they will once again be able to dwell in their land, Ashanatati Labdi Yaakov, the land that was promised to uh, the patriarch Jacob. Now, of course, we know that the land was promised not only to the patriarch Jacob, but it was promised to his father, the patriarch Isaac, and to his grandfather, the patriarch Abraham as well. Uh, why the reference here is only to Jacob and not to Abraham and Isaac may only be simply because uh, this is his habit uh, to redress the uh, people of Israel as the house of, uh, of Jacob. You notice that I underlined the line, that God declares that he will be sanctified amidst the people of Israel in full sight of the nations of the world. Um, this is uh, a, a theme uh, that uh, the prophet Yechezkel strikes more than once. And here I have uh, brought down one of the other places in which he strikes this theme, the theme in which God says that the ingathering of the exiles, that the return or the restoration of the Jewish people to their homeland will be an opportunity for God to be, for God's reputation to be restored, so to speak for God to be sanctified and for his name to be magnified. As though when the people of Israel went into exile, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, sages of the Talmud tells us that the divine presence, the Shekhinah, went into exile with them. And in exile, the name of God is diminished. Therefore, when the Jewish people return to the land of Israel and the Shekhinah once again takes up residence in their midst, then it will be magnified, it will return or resume its earlier proportions. And if you see the verse there, this is the prophet citing, speaking in the name of God, the hit God dil ti, the hit kadishti. God says that he will he will be um, uh, magnified, right? Gadol, magnified and he will be sanctified. And he will be known to many different nations. And what will they know? They will know that indeed he is the Lord. Two things about this. One pertains to the words uh, If they sound somewhat familiar uh, it's because they're the opening words, or they are a variation on the opening words of Kaddish. The opening words of Kaddish are Yitgadal, the Yitkadash, Shmei Rabbah. May the 
name of God, may the great name of God be magnified and be sanctified. As a matter of fact, you may have uh, heard, um, uh, you may be acquainted with someone who actually uh, recites the Kaddish with slightly different vocalization. There is a tradition that recites the first two words of the Kaddish, uh, not as Yitgadal the Yitkadash, but rather as Yitgadel the Yitkadesh. The difference is whether you pronounce it as though it were Aramaic, and that's Yitgadal the Yitkadash, or whether you pronounce it as though it were Hebrew, which is Yitgadel the Yitkadesh. But given that almost the entirety of the Kaddish, up to the very last sentence of Ose Shalom Bim Ramab, is clearly Aramaic, why would it occur to anybody that the first two words are Hebrew? Here you have the answer. The answer is that there is a theory that suggests that the first two words of Kaddish were actually patterned after this pasuk in the book of Yechezkel. And therefore, since this clearly is hit Kaddish, Hit gadilti the hit kadishti is clearly Hebrew. Ergo, the words yit, gad, yit gadel the yit kadesh should be treated as Hebrew also. That's the first item. Second item has to do with the uh, underlinings in yellow. And God continues and he says, Vyashavu aleha, that the Jews, having returned from their captivity, from exile, will take up residence in their land. Lavetach in tranquility. And the examples of tranquility are vanu vatim, they will be able to rebuild the homes that were destroyed, vinat uch ramim, and they will replant the vineyards that were destroyed, v'yashavu vetach, and they will reside in tranquility. When? Ba'asoti shifatim, God says, when I will have executed judgment, Bechol hashatimotam against all those who hold them in disdain, viadu and even those their enemies, right, their opponents who have held them in disdain, will come to know ki ani Hashem Eloheihem that I am the Lord their God. This may very well be why this haftara was selected for this week's sidra. This week's sidra of Vaera introduces us to the plagues to the makot. And the function of the makot was precisely what the Navi Yechezkel here has reminded us of. As we see in these two verses that are taken from the first one from our Sidra Va'era, the second one from next week's Sidra, God says, V'yada'u Mitzrayim ki ani Hashem. In order that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, how will they know it? When I raise my hand, as it were, to strike Egypt, and I will take the, uh, the people of Israel out from their midst. Same idea, right? Just as the prophet Yechezkel addresses the Jewish people in their exile and says, God will take them out. And, and by doing so, God will will make uh, the people, the nations in whose midst they are living will come to know and recognize God. So it was at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, at the time of the Exodus. God would take the Jews out of Egypt and the Egyptians thereby would come to recognize him. Same thing in the verse from uh, next week's Idra. God says, This is of course the eve of the Exodus itself. God says that he will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and he will smite every firstborn, both human and animal. And here's the other tie-in, and when it comes to all of those things that are considered deities by the Egyptians, all of those things that they worship, I will execute judgment. So we can see that Yechezkel here has combined these two elements. The element that Esesh Fatim, that when God executes judgment against the Gentiles, against the nations who oppress Israel, then two things happen. Israel is saved, 
And there is now an opportunity for the people who had been their oppressors to recognize God. And as you see from the very last uh, pasuk that I brought here from Yechezkel, this isn't the first time that he's done it. Several chapters earlier in chapter 25, addressing the nation of Moab, he said identically, Uva Moab, shefatim, I will execute judgment, viyadu ki ani Hashem, and they will come to know that I recognize that I am God. So we can see here, even in these two psukim, these two very brief psukim at the beginning of this week's Haftarah, some of the rather characteristics of the prophecies of the Navi Yechezkel. And then we move from chapter 28 into chapter 29. One of the uh, things, uh, again, that is uh, somewhat uh, characteristic uh, of the prophet Yechezkel, as a matter of fact, it's not only characteristic, it's almost idiosyncratic, is that um, he dates his prophecies, okay? Uh, there is maybe one, or, there are maybe one or two references to, to dates in the entire book of Yeshayahu. There are several more in the book of Yirmiyahu because a good deal of the book of Yirmiyahu is historical rather than purely prophetic. But Yechezkel is outstanding in actually identifying the month and the, the, the day and the month and the year in which he received several of his prophecies. So the one that we're dealing with now, he says, was revealed to him in the 10th year, Ba'asiri on the 10th, in the 10th month, Bishnei Masar Lachodesh on the 12th day of that month. So it's the 12th day of the 10th month of the 10th year. Now, what's the 10th month? Where do you start counting? So we know that traditionally, right, traditionally, we start counting months in, in, in biblical chronology, counts from the month of Nisan, because years, it, it, certainly in, in the books of, 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 um, of Nevi'im, uh, years are determined by, uh, by the reigns of kings. And since the reign of a Jewish king is uh, counts from the first day of the month of Nisan, and not from the first day of the month of Tishrei, then if we want to know what the 10th month is, we have to start counting from Nisan. And the 10th month from Nisan is Tevet. Okay? Does it sound familiar? If you haven't davened Ma'ariv yet, okay, it might, it really isn't, but it could still be Tevet, right? Tonight is Rosh Chodesh Shavat. So this Nevoah, this prophecy of Yechezkel, okay, occurred on the 10th day of the month of Tevet. Now, when he says it happened in the 10th year, 10th year of what? So as I mentioned, chronology, biblical chronology, usually is pegged to the reign of kings. And we know in the reign of which kings Yechezkel prophesied, it was primarily during the reign of the very, very last king to sit on the throne of Yehuda of Judah. And that was a king named Tzidkiyahu, who ascended the throne in roughly 598 or 597 BCE. And he was sitting, he was the, the ruling monarch at the end of his reign 11 years later in the year 586, in which the Babylonians finally came and besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the city and the temple. So effectively, this prophecy is a year before the destruction of the first temple. Now, it's very interesting. There are scholars and historians who uh, have uh, been able to, um, to, uh, uh, to chart dates in biblical history 
against the secular calendar, which means that there is an opinion amongst historians, biblical historians, that gives a secular date to what is listed here as the 10th of the month of Tevet on the 10th year of the reign of King Tzidkiyahu. And let me show you what it comes out to. Happy 2,608th birthday of chapter 29 in the book of Yechezkel. Now, it isn't, it isn't 100% exact because it isn't the 13th of January, but believe it or not, with, we're within a week of it. The 10th day of Tevet in the year 587 was January 7th. So what a coincidence that we're able to sit here in the week of January 7th and to mark it, mark this most auspicious occasion. And I couldn't find a birthday cake with 2,608 candles on it, but I tried to get one with as many candles as I could find. And now we're back. Okay. Verse two, Ben Adam, son of man, right? We already took note of that when we looked at chapter 38 in Yechezkel earlier this year. That is the name by which the prophet is called. When God summons him, he summons him not as by his name, Yechezkel, but he summons him by the epithet, Ben Adam, son of man. And what does he instruct him? Him becomes abundantly clear why this is the Haftarah for this week's Sidra, Simpanecha al Paro Melech Mitzrayim, turn or confront Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the Hinnave Alav, and recite a prophecy about him, the Al Mitzrayim Kula, and about an, a prophecy about the entire nation of Egypt. And this is what the prophecy is. Koamar Hashem Elohim, these are the words of God. God is going to confront Pharaoh. God is going to uh, attack Pharaoh. And he describes Pharaoh as Hatanim Hagadol, the great dragon, Harovets Betoch Yeorav, who crouches or lies down in the midst of the Nile, Asher Amar, and who says of himself, Li Yeori, the Nile belongs to me, Vaani Asitini, and I have made it for myself. Now, again, this is something that we have taken note of previously when we spoke about Joseph and Pharaoh, right? That Pharaoh, right, was uh, Pharaoh was regarded by the Egyptians as a god. And one of the things that Pharaoh did. Uh, ostensibly, in order to demonstrate his divinity, was that he would ostensibly um, cause the Nile to rise. Okay, what really happened is that the Egyptian scientists and the Egyptians were quite good at astronomy. Right? The Egyptian scientists were able to figure out uh, the uh, the tides, and they were able to predict when the Nile would rise. So that just before the Nile was going to rise anyway, Pharaoh would go down to the Nile and he would probably stand there and he would raise his hands and say whatever the ancient Egyptian equivalent was of abracadabra, hocus pocus. And what do you know? The Nile would rise. And that of course confirmed in the minds of the Egyptians that Pharaoh was the God of the Nile. Okay. But what is God going to do with this Pharaoh with this dragon who lies in the sea. Venatati chachim bilchayecha says God, I will put fish hooks into your jaws. Vihidbakti degat yeorecha bekas kisotecha, and I will cause all of the fish in the Nile to cling to your scales. 
Vaha'aliticha mitoch yo'orecha. And once I've got this hook in your mouth, and the hook arguably is at the end of my fishing line, right? I will be able to pull you out of the Nile. Ve'et kol degat yo'orecha v'kas kesotecha tidbak while all of the other fish of the Nile will be still clinging to your scales. And what will God do to this sea dragon and to the fish? He'll kill them. How? By simply casting them, as it were, into the wilderness, into a place where there is little or no water. Otcha you and all the other fish of the Nile, you will fall there in the field, nobody will come to gather you in, and you will be there, your carcasses will be there, and they will be consumed by the beasts of the field and by the birds uh, of prey. So this is the fate that lies in store for Pharaoh and for the Egyptians. Okay. This reference to Pharaoh as the Tanin HaGadol HaRovetz Bayaor, as this great dragon who crouches or lies in the rivers or in the Nile, harkens back, which seems strange because the citation is from Psalms, harkens back to something that uh, that occurred either literally or metaphorically way back at the time of creation. You see this verse from Psalm 74. It's speaking about the past. And it says of God that in the past, yam, that with your strength, you splintered, you tore the sea apart, Shibarta Rashe Taninim Al Hamayim. You smashed the heads of the dragons of the Taninim on the waters or in the waters. This is a theme that's quite um, common in ancient Near Eastern mythology. It exists in the myths of the Mesopotamian peoples, back to the Sumerians and the Akkadians, and the Assyrians, and the Babylonians. It appears amongst the people of the land of Canaan, going back to Ugaritic and to Canaanite epics, that creation was preceded by a cosmic battle. And the opponents in the cosmic battle were the good gods who are in the sky, and the evil gods who were in the ocean. So that the battle involves sea creatures, dragons or monsters who live in the sea. And in fact, the Pasuk mentions two of them by name. One is the Tanin and the other is a Livyatan. Livyatan is modern Hebrew for a whale but Leviathan also means some sort of enormous sea creature. Now, the curious thing is that if this is a myth, what is it doing in Tehillim? Now, there are two answers to it. The simple answer is that in Tehillim, it's metaphorical. How do I know that it's metaphorical? because of the next citation, the one that comes from the prophet Yeshayahu. In Yeshayahu, as you see, highlighted in red, there are also references to the same creatures, to the Leviathan and to the Tanin. The difference is that while the reference in Tehillim is to the destruction of the sea creatures that is supposed to have occurred in the past at the time of creation, the destruction of the sea creatures in the prophecy of Yeshayahu are only going to happen in the eschatological future. Bayom hahu, on that distant day. Now, wait a second. If God destroyed them at the time of creation, then they don't exist anymore. And if they don't exist anymore, then how can you prophesy that God is once again going to destroy them? 
The answer, of course, is because we're not talking about real creatures or even real mythological creatures. We're talking about metaphors. What to the ancient Near Eastern people, what to the pagans and idolaters of the ancient Near East were real flesh and blood, right? mythological creatures were to the prophets and poets of Israel metaphors for evil, for the forces of evil. So what the, what the verse in Psalms is saying is that God had to overcome evil in the past. And what the verse in Isaiah is saying is that God unfortunately will once again have to overcome evil in the future. Told you there are two answers. The other one is a little more, how should I put it? Well, I'll tell you, I, I won't characterize it. I'll just tell you what it is. I mentioned just a, 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 a couple of minutes ago, uh, I made reference to the, um, the creation myths of the ancient Near East. In the creation myths of the ancient Near East, as I said, there are good gods who are usually the sky, gods of the sky. And then there, there are the evil gods who are, uh, who are represented by or who enlist um, creatures of the sea, okay? So it basically says that in order for God to be able to create the world, he had to put down a rebellion, as it were, that featured the sea and creatures in the sea. Now, if you stop to think about it, what's the only thing we know from the book of Breshit? What's the only thing we know existed before creation? Now, I obviously tell me, tell me God existed before creation, I, I, I know. But if we're reading the text of Breshit, and you don't need to read any more than the first couple of verses, before God says vayihi or, right? Before God engages in his very first act of creation, something already exists. And you know what that is? Yeah, the sea. V'ha'aretz ha'ita tohu v'avohu v'choshech Al pnei tehom, v'ruach Elohim merachefet al pnei ha mayim. There was water. There was tehom, deep waters, even before, arguably, even before, God indulged in the very first act of creation. Okay. Nothing more to say about that at this moment. It may very well uh, recur uh, at some uh, future point, but we've got more of the Haftarah to cover. Okay. And it says as follows. Okay. All the nations, Yadu Ko Yoshvei Mitzrayim, all the inhabitants of Egypt will come to know that I am the Lord. Okay. We've seen this before. Ya'an, on account of what? Heyotam mishenet kanel levet Yisrael, because Egypt has served the house of Israel as a mishenet, that's something that you lean on. But usually, if you can't stand up straight and you need to lean on something, a crutch or a cane, it's going to be something solid that can support you. But what kind of a support, what kind of a mishenet was Egypt? A mishenet kane. Kane, of course, we know, we've had it before. Those are the reeds that grow alongside the Nile. They're hollow. If you fashion a cane or a crutch out of a hollow reed, right, then there's a very good chance that when you lean on it, it's going to break. Therefore, the best way that the prophet found in which to symbolize the fact that Israel was leaning on Egypt, was counting on Egypt for support, but that Egypt was unable or unwilling to give it that support, 
is to characterize Egypt as a hollow reed. Which betof sambach, that when you grab this hollow reed, right, bakaf in your, in your hand, te rots, it breaks apart. Uvakata lahem kol katef, right, and, uh, and you make uh, all of their, when you lean on it, uh, it, it breaks, and, and all of the, your, your shoulders, hishaman lecha tishaver, when you lean upon it again, it breaks, amadatalem kol motnayim, and it isn't something that you can count upon. And this too is a theme that uh, is struck on a number of occasions in reference to Egypt. We see it in the book of Malachim Bet, okay, towards the end. So this indeed is approaching the period of time in which the prophet Yechezkel is prophesying. So even then, Israel was still turning to Egypt for support, and Egypt is still being characterized as this kaneratzutz, as this hollow reed. Now, what's going on here that has caused Israel to lean upon Egypt? Let me find that reference. Yes, what, um, what has caused Israel to lean upon Egypt is the advancing armies of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, okay? Babylon, Iraq, okay? To the northeast of the land of Israel, okay? If you're coming from the land of the two rivers of the Euphrates and the Tigris, if you're coming from Iraq to the land of Israel, two things happen. One is, that there's some place you're going to go, pass through before you reach the land of Israel. And the second is that once you reach the land of Israel, that's not the end of the road. There's something that lies beyond the land of Israel. The land of Israel in the biblical period, not only in the biblical period, um, it's, it's the history, the destiny, or the faith of the land of Israel. <clears throat> to lie at one of the crossroads of the world. You probably remember back from, you know, uh, junior high school, the notion of the fertile crescent, right? The crescent, the half moon shape that goes from Mesopotamia in the Northeast, along the Mediterranean coastline through the land of Israel and down across the Sinai desert and into Egypt, okay? Egypt was an empire, Babylon was an empire, and they always had designs upon one another. So when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians set out, they didn't necessarily set out to conquer the land of Israel, after which they were going to say, that's it, mission accomplished, and head back home. It's quite likely that their intent overall was to confront their rival empire in Egypt. But in order to get from Mesopotamia to Egypt, you have to pass through the land of Israel. Before they even passed through the land of Israel, the Babylonians went through the land of Canaan to the north of the land of Israel the land of, again, go back to our junior high school uh, geography and history, the land of the Phoenicians. And that's the reference here in the continuation of the Haftarah. Here we're in the 27th year, that is 17 years later than the previous Haftarah, as you see. 571, but it's in April, so I didn't make a birthday cake for it, okay? As you see, it's Barishon, the first month, the first day of the month of Nisan of the year 571. What has happened? Hayad Hashem more. 
God says to the prophet, Ben Adam, again, Nebuchadnezzar Melech Bavel, He'evid et chelo avoda gedola el tsor. He has caused his army to serve a great service against Tyre, one of the chief uh, cities of the Phoenicians. Okay. And what does he say? That at the end of this, on that day, right? Here in verse 19, Lachain, this is what God says, meaning he, that, that the prophet foresaw that the, uh, as you see here, right? Um, Nebuchadnezzar sought to secure his hold on Syria, Palestine by subjugating Egypt. To do this, he needed to control the coastal approach to Egypt and perhaps even to possess a fleet of ships and a base for it. And this might very well be supposed to explain why he started his campaign against Egypt in Phoenicia. So here we are, we are after the destruction of the first temple, okay? But the Babylonians have not withdrawn back to Mesopotamia. They're still situated in the land of Israel and to the north of the land of Israel because they still have designs on Egypt. And the message which with, with which the Haftarah concludes is as follows, right? God says that God will, that he will give the land of Egypt to Nebuchadnezzar, okay? And then he says in the concluding verse of the Haftarah, on that day by Yom Ahu, atzmiach keren levet Yisrael. He will literally cause a horn to grow on the house of Israel and to you, the prophet, in particular, attain pitchon pe betocham, and will give you an opportunity to address them. And he concludes with the words that we've seen now over and over and over again, one of the leading themes in the entire book of Yechezkel, v'yada'u ki ani Hashem, so that everyone will come to recognize that I am the Lord. And this, too, is a significant thing. Because you see here in the very last citation, it comes from the Book of Lamentations, the book that, according to tradition, was written by the prophet Yirmiyahu in order to, to mourn the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonians in 586. And when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, the prophet said of this event, speaking of God, Gada Bachori Af that God in his anger cut off kol keren Yisrael. He cut off the horn of Israel. Horns are, again, either a sign of strength, or if you wish, they're just simply a sign of something that's imposing. Think not so much of the horns of a of a, of a domesticated animal. Think of the horns of a bull. Think of the horns of, or the antlers of a deer, right? Um, one of the, if you ever see the deers in, in, in combat with each other when they lock horns, okay? So the idea of a horn is that it is emblematic of strength. So when the temple in Jerusalem were destroyed, it was as though the horns of Israel, the strength of Israel, was cut off. Therefore, and since we can assume that the people were acquainted with this figure of speech, if the prophet Yechezkel now comes to them and says that there will be a day on which God will cause the horns that were cut off to grow back in, then this would be understood and interpreted by the people as a prophecy of consolation and that they would eventually regain the strength that they had lost. We skipped a little along the way. I don't think we necessarily skipped anything of great consequences. You can see, didn't really have anything here 
uh, particularly underlined. So let's um, have a look at the chat and see uh, where we can go. Um, okay. Uh, it's not, uh, sorry, can't. Yes, Corin New Corin. Yes, I mentioned. Uh, as I said, uh, thank you. I, uh, Ezekiel sixteen one to fourteen. Uh, I can look that up very quickly and see if I can take a stab at why it was chosen. Um, but as I said, my I don't have at the moment. Don't happen to have any any chumashim uh, at home that actually list anything for the sidra of Shmot, other as I said, than the haftarah of the Sfaradim. So I guess. Have chapter 16, 1 to 14. What does it say? It says, mm, don't know, can't tell offhand. I, I'll have a go at it maybe for next week. Okay. Uh, okay. Am I using the, oh, um, yeah. I, I don't know if you can all see this. Uh, this, this is my guide to uh, uh, this Haftarah. Um, it's a volume in the Anchor Bible series. The Anchor Bible series is a, uh, a, a um, non-denominational uh, series. Uh, of, uh, of uh, Bible commentaries, uh, and rather fortunately, the commentary on the first 37 chapters of the book of Ezekiel uh, were all written by the late professor Moshe Greenberg uh, of the Hebrew University and prior to that of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, a scholar whose uh, knowledge of uh, and appreciation for a traditional rabbinic and medieval uh, Jewish uh, exegesis is unparalleled, was unparalleled uh, amongst modern Bible scholars. Uh, and uh, I got the date from his book. Uh, so I I'm assuming that since this is something that was could only have been done in the last century, uh, I'm pretty sure that the date is a Gregorian date and not a Julian date. The month of January may or may not have existed. As I said, it's just simply a way, simply a, a an attempt to an attempt to say something to people who, if you tell them that it was the tenth of Tevet, will scratch their heads and said, "But Tevet isn't always in the same time." So this is a reasonably reasonable way of of doing it. Okay, uh, what does this say? Uh, the Nile is. Not estuarin, more likely refer to annual flooding. Um, oh, like, like the Hudson's not a river, it's an estuary because one end of it goes into the ocean. Um, yeah, so the Nile doesn't go into the ocean, it goes into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I had uh, uh, several opportunities to uh, fly uh, in Egypt, uh, from Cairo to, um, uh, to uh, Aswan uh, in the south. Uh, and uh, you can see it now on Google Earth. Uh, when I did it uh, 40 more years ago, uh, it was the only way to do it. But uh, you can see it now on Google Earth. Uh, you see that uh, Egypt is uh, arid. Uh, it, it's, it's barren, right? Then you see a tiny little strip of green tiny little strip of green um, uh, from uh, the south going northwards, right? Because the headwaters of the Nile are in the south, right? Uh, 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 that's why Upper Egypt is in the south and Lower Egypt is in the north, okay? And uh, so you see the Nile and then you see it branches off and, and creates uh, what uh, is called the Nile Delta, okay? Uh, and, and you see those tiny little green lines all over, um, like spider veins, uh, and it's a remarkable sight. And it, it really, it really, 
captures uh, what the ancient uh, Greek uh, historian uh, um, Herodotus uh, meant when he declared Egypt to be the gift of the Nile. Okay. Um, yes, yes, good, good. Everybody got the Ruach Elohim or Achefet al Pnei Hamayim. Okay. If the purpose of the Exodus was to make the Egyptians know God, no God, was it necessary for Yechezkel to prophesy that God in the future will make the Egyptians? Yeah, uh, only because we're, we're human uh, and we forget. Uh, and the more human we are, the more forgetful we get. Uh, according to rabbinic tradition, uh, forgetfulness uh, is the result of sin. Uh, and therefore, I assume that the more sinful people are, the more forgetful they will be. Uh, and therefore, the Egyptians probably were a considerably sinful people. And therefore, having been t having realized or recognized once that the existence of God didn't necessarily mean that they were going to remember it the next day, or for that matter, even the next millennium. Okay. Uh... Yes, Jews follow the Julian calendar. I, I mentioned that, I think, on a previous occasion uh, when we were about to start um, uh, reciting Talum Atar Levracha on the 5th of December, which obviously has nothing to do with the Gregorian calendar. It's, it's a throwback to the Julian calendar. But actually, we don't follow the Julian calendar. We follow the, the, the Shmuelian calendar. Yes, I, I will admit that the Amora Shmuel of the third century um, was a Julian, uh, but the calendar that we f the calendar that we follow, uh, you you won't find the name Julian in, in any discussion of the calendar in rabbinic literature. It's all attributed to the Amora Shmuel. Okay, um, is there a tension between the message and tone of this haftarah and the commandment Lo Tita'ev Mitzri? Um, 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 no, no. Um, there, there are commandments similarly uh, not to scorn or despise um, uh, or, or to show um, antipathy or hatred to Moabites uh, and Ammonites as well. Um, it, it's basically a lesson in gratitude and ingratitude. Uh, since the Egyptians took us in, there was indeed a period of time when arguably um, the house of Israel would have perished if it had not been given sanctuary in the land of Egypt right, during, the, during the, the years of famine. Uh, and, uh, and even beyond the years of famine, until such a time as we read last week, until a new king rose up over Egypt who uh, knew not Joseph, right, uh, throughout that entire period of time, uh, which was not a matter of weeks or years, or even for that matter, decades, but was a matter of centuries, right? Uh, the Jews lived well uh, in Egypt. Uh, and therefore, uh, for that, uh, for that we, we have to remain grateful, even if there was a subsequent period of time when uh, the Egyptians earned our uh, distrust through their oppression of us. So, no. Lotata Ev Mitzri doesn't, first of all, refers to individual Egyptians, uh, not necessarily to the entire nation of Egypt. Okay. Uh, and it basically says that, you know, um, as, as good as things are, you have to remember that there was a time when things were worse. And therefore, you have to imagine that they could get worse yet again in the future. And no matter how bad things get, you have to remind yourself that they can get better. Speaking of which, Good night to you all. Okay, thank you very much. I, again, I just want to mention to thank the Alman family, Rabbi Rafal and Sharon Alman, who are sponsoring all the Haftorah of Sefer Shmot and uh, in memory of their parents and their son, Rashmuel Eliyahu. So uh, I want to thank them and the Schut of, uh, of Limut Torah should uh, help, uh, help the Neshamot and uh, help us all. Uh, thank you very much. Uh,